Yeah. You know, when I was in South Africa. You know, um, one of my uh, friends had uh, another friend that owned a game farm. Okay. I mean, it's a big open expanse of, of property, you know, that's fenced, but it's, you know, it's a, I don't even know how many heck acres it is, but it's a gigantic place and you're able to go out there and hunt, but uh, there's a price uh, associated with every animal that you get. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a spring box is pretty cheap because there are a lot of them. Reeboks are more expensive. Kudu are even more expensive. And then you get into the lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. Uh, and those things can be incredibly expensive. But what they're doing is they're um, they're managing their inventory. So, yep. you know, people are worried about, you know, animals being hunted to extinction on these game farms. You have to understand that they don't want their animals to become extinct because, you know, you're actually paying, you know, you might pay $50,000 to, to get a lion. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that goes to um, growing other lions, you know what I mean? For the future. So, uh, you know, these animals are much better uh, managed uh, for posterity on the game farms than they are uh, uh, otherwise. Welcome to The Outliers Inn, produced by the Operational Excellence Society and sponsored by Zonotech Consulting Group International, with your hosts, Joseph Paris and David Schneider. Welcome, everybody, for another episode of The Outliers Inn. I'm your host, Joe Paris, uh, known affectionately as JP on the internet, and standing in for our... Uh, uh, normal co-host is Don the Beer Man Bursnick. How you doing, Don? Good. How you doing, Joe? Not so bad. Uh, thanks once again for standing in at last moment. Um, I think that uh, we should perhaps uh, be thankful for uh, David, uh, or he should be thankful for us, because uh, I know what I'm going to get him for his for his uh, holidays. Uh, it's definitely going to be a camera and a and a watch. Um, because how about, he just how about a how about an application for uh, PETA? Yeah, or an egg. Yeah, he's out there hunting pheasant this week, and they they racked up a whole mess of them uh, from the uh, the, the uh, pictures I saw on the internet. But uh, oh, yeah. you know, and, and to my knowledge, he was neither he neither pulled a Dick Cheney nor was the victim of a Dick Cheney. You know, uh, or, <laughs> didn't get he, shot or didn't shoot anybody. <laughs> well, you know, that's the only thing we could assume for the time being. And if that is the case, that he has neither been shot nor have shot, uh, you know, a person anyway, um, then he could probably be thankful for that. Yeah, really. You yeah. know, no charges or anything like that. You know, not unless and, it was justified. Yeah, and of course, Dick Cheney, he only used buckshot. It could have been worse. It could have been Alec Baldwin. Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, then again, you got to think about the people that, you know, the person who was shot, apparently he was an attorney. So, you know, there's kind of, you know, good and bad to that. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, but, you know, you think of Dick Cheney or an attorney, which, you know, that's a real that's a real coin, a coin toss as far as yeah, I'm really. concerned. <laughs> So, so, so for those so for those people that are not um, uh, privy to the uh, traditions uh, in America about Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving is a national holiday, and uh, you know it's a basically a memorial or memorandum or whatever it is that you want to call it of uh, the pilgrims when they first came to uh, the Americas and and survived uh, for a period of time at the with the help of the uh, the Native Americans and uh, they gave thanks and had a big feast. Now in Canada, because it's a little colder in Canada, uh, they celebrate their Thanksgiving in October. Um, so uh, you have that. It's a little piece of trivia there for you, Don. Yeah, really. Thanks. Needed that one. <laughs> yeah. So, so my understanding is that you'd be thankful for a new creaser. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, our keys are broke the other day. We don't know what's wrong with it. We're going to get some spare parts on order this week, see if we can get it fixed. If not, then uh, it's probably going to go into trash, unfortunately. It's not that old either. I think we've only had it a couple of years. But, uh, yeah, well, yeah. did did you buy it new or did you? Because I know yeah. I did some of the modifications yeah, to it. We we um, bought it brand new. Really? And yeah. and it's only yeah. been two years and it's kicked the, kicked the can. Yeah. Oh, it can now, does, it have, um, does it have refrigerant in it? Well, that's the thing is you can't check. You can't check unless you open the system back up. They've got to have a way to connect to it and how they do it. I have no idea. 
So, I mean, it's just one of those deals. And what's it going to cost for us to have somebody come in and take a look at it and try right. and fix it? So, yeah, you yeah, might as well get another one, that right? Stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe maybe get a bigger one too. You know. <laughs> Well, you know, you have those things stuffed to the, you know, to the gunnels with the, how many you got in there? Five, five keggers in there? Well, we got, we got five in there right now and we probably got five or six in the fermenters. So oh. you're gonna, <laughs> yeah, you're we kind of, we, we kind of tried to go get ahead of the game here a little bit. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to take December off and uh, we're probably going to brew. What we want to do is we want to brew. Uh, we've got four high gravity beers that we've been working on that we want to brew. And I think we're going to do that. So they'll all be sitting there conditioning until like next year. Right, so, right. so what, uh, what do you have to be thankful for this year? Uh, well, <laughs> it's been a good year business wise. Business has been really busy. You know, it's like I tell everybody, I complain when I'm too busy, but I'm complaining when I'm, you know, when you're not doing anything. So it, it's been a good year. Uh, been a real good year so far. Uh, hopefully it continues and continues in the next year so we could really use it. Um, you know, I, you know, standard stuff, you know, I got a good wife who takes care of me and, you know, takes care of the house and stuff like that. You know, real thankful for that. Um, you know, kids are doing pretty good. I'm, I'm a great grandfather now. Oh my gosh. So, great grandfather. Oh yeah. Great grandfather. Yep. You must, got, have, you yeah. must have started early, man. I mean, uh, I did. I had kids when I was young and stupid. Yeah. So, you know, and, and um, now it's great grandkids when you're old and stupid. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I didn't have anything to do with these. So you ah. know, I have, to, you know, after the first batch, that's it. I'm kind of, you know, <laughs> it's not my decision. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she's oh, she's adorable. She's gonna be one spoiled kid. There's no doubt about that. So there's a whole bunch of relatives that are flocking around and everything. So yeah, mm-hmm. she's a cute, adorable, adorable kid. Yeah. Is your uh, son helping you out with the beers? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Well, he he's had to take the lead because I've been on the road so much. You know, that's oh I've, I've been trying. To, last week I was actually here for the whole week, and uh, got a phone call on Friday and said we got to have you down here in Jersey. So I have to go down to Jersey on Wednesday and try and get this machine fixed. So, All right. how about oh, the windsock? Is is the windsock still there? Oh yeah. Windstock's still there. You know, we keep it up and, uh, you know, I take care of it every now and then. I still haven't, I got to put a ring up on the top and makes it a little bit more flexible, but you know, yeah, it's, it's still there. <laughs> that was an interesting story. Yeah. But, we got to do is take a picture of it so I could snip it into the, uh, to the video <laughs> version. Yeah, I can do that. That's there. no problem. <laughs> so what about you? What are you thankful for? Well, this has been a crazy year for me. Um, I don't, I don't recall a year where I've actually been out in the field as much as I've been this year. Um, you yeah. know, back in December, I think I put out like four, four or five proposals, and seven of them came back signed. And next thing <laughs> I know, I'm, you know, uh, on site in January. Uh, in Denver, I have a nice, nice sized project in Denver, and I've been going out there a week or two a month ever since. Um, so that's been going, uh, pretty good. And I got a bunch of other projects and it looks like, a a bunch of work is coming in for next year too. <laughs> You'll probably find me in, uh, in Houston and in South Africa and, uh, and points beyond. So, uh, oh, going, back, you know, going back to your old stomping grounds down in South Africa. You know, huh? I, I gotta tell you, it was funny when I, I had the call with them, uh, two weeks ago and uh, the introductory call. And, you know, I'm thankful for my book. My book has made a lot of traction. And uh, uh, actually, both of these projects be, uh, came around because of it, and because of my other writings. But it was funny, because when I was having the call with the uh, team in South Africa, I actually didn't know that they're from South Africa. Okay, you know, I usually, <laughs> I usually look at where the people are from and what company I knew the company. But I didn't know where where they were located, so I happened to be wearing my Springbok uh, jersey. You know, my uh, Springboks is the uh, South African national rugby team. Okay, <laughs> so I happened to be wearing this, you know, this Springbok uh, rugby jersey because it's a heavy jersey and it's getting kind of cold up here in Frankfurt. Um, and so next thing I know, they're you know they're on the line and they see the jersey and um, you know there's some you know pretty fun banter uh, as a result of that but uh you know it's it's been a good year so i'm you know so far knock on some wood i'm you know good health i never had you know covid knock on some more wood um <laughs> you know just you know things have been 
been grooving. The family's good. So, you know, what, what can I say? I mean, uh, uh, yeah. certainly could be a lot worse than it is. So uh, oh, yeah. I'm thankful no that it's not. That. My parents are doing yeah. well. They don't never change. So, uh, yeah, that's. Yeah. You got to have more hotel stays than I've got. I'm, I racked, Dude. I checked the other day. I'm like over 90 this year. 90 oh yeah. I'm, I'm well over that. I, uh, I, I stay at the embassy suites in Denver, uh, when I'm there. Um, and it's really, uh, kind of cool, uh, <clears throat> because, you know, they, uh, you know, they, I'm there often enough that I get to know everybody, you know what I mean? It's kind of, yeah. you know, it's, it's, you know, cool, but it's sad at the same time, you know, you're not supposed right. to, yeah. you know, it's kind know of deja the entire, vu. yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but, uh, I, and I, I can't really share this, but, uh, when I was uh, leaving last, uh, last time I decided to stay at the Westin, uh, instead of the off airport hotel, the Westin is right at the hotel. And, right. um, you know, you're, you know, you're, I, I, I'm staying there because it wasn't ridiculously expensive. It was just expensive. Uh, the off hotel uh, or off airport uh, hotel is about 170 bucks. This was like 350, but you know, I was just tired and I just felt like, you know, rolling out of bed, going downstairs and being at the airport and just like going. Um, yeah. so after dinner, <clears throat> You know, I'm sitting at the uh, pub in the lobby as I'm apt to do uh, from time to time. And uh, I, you know, I'm sitting there by myself and there's another guy there. Uh, and I introduce myself so we can start talking because, you know, if you're drinking alone, you have a problem, but if you're drinking with somebody, you don't have a problem. Uh, so, so I'm sitting there uh, uh, having a couple of cocktails with him and he starts telling me what he does. And um, I go upstairs and I grab a copy of my book because he's in leadership consulting. I grab a copy of my book and I sign it over to him. And I'm not going to tell you who it was uh, on the podcast, but it was a pretty significant um, uh, introduction. And I have a call with him uh, the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, right before the, uh, the meeting that shall remain nameless. Cause I'll be back, uh, <laughs> this Friday and I hope to catch you guys, but yeah, uh, it was, it was a pretty serendipitous, uh, if that's a word, uh, uh meeting. So we have a, yeah. a guest here today. Um, Stefan, a regular, uh, irregular, regular, as, as the case <laughs> might be. How you doing there, Stefan? I, I am fine. What about you? We're good. Ah. Yeah, you know, none the worse for the wear. Uh, maybe I did make one K on United this year, so I think it's like the the highest you can be without being like in the super secret society. Um, so uh, not so bad. How about you there, Stefan? My well, everything is good. Yeah, I think business has been good. So yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So. And we're going to get together at a Christmas market uh, in December. Yeah, that's a good plan. Yeah, it's yeah. a special Christmas market. It, it is a special Christmas market. <laughs> I was really quite surprised at the restrictions that there are and what you can sell. Like you can't sell a, a crucifix at a Christmas market. Yeah, exactly. It's a Christmas can't? market. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's it's a it's a weird Christmas market in the sense that they 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 put sort sort of a list of things that you can sell and things that you cannot sell. And of course, they did not manage to change it from, you know, Christmas market to winter market because it's a market that has been around for, you know, centuries. <laughs> and then you say, what the heck is that? You know, why are you commanding people what they can sell and what they cannot sell? But anyway, this is probably the modern times that, you know, you have to tell people what they can sell and what they cannot sell. So it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. It's really crazy. Especially yeah. re the horse is the food. You know, it's not like, you know, fair enough that you cannot sell, you know, whatever, oh, some, some some special things I can imagine. But then the food, you cannot serve any, any all the food. You have to serve local food that, that is to be, you know, so you made. you can't serve any food? Sorry? Did you say you can't serve any, they can't serve any food? No, they, sell, they can serve food. No, they cannot oh. serve any food. They have to serve a list of food that has been agreed beforehand to the business. So the, the list is oh, really right. drastic. You can only sell local specialties, but of course, local specialties are very local, if you know what I mean. So basically <laughs> you are very restricted. So you say, I would like to have a hot dog. You cannot have because this is not local. I would like to have, I don't know, you know, things you eat at the Christmas market, basically. <laughs> so this is a- Now they will have glue vine, right? They will have like a mold wine. I'm not even convinced, <laughs> you know, yes, maybe, 
it, it will have to be local milled wine, you know, which of course it's. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I I can't. You know, this is this is going to be in Strasbourg, uh, which is just over the border uh, from Germany in France. Um, it's a lovely little town. Uh, Stefan and I had a, a, a lunch dinner there um, over the summertime, and it's really, really a cute little town. But, um, you know, to find out that, you know, there's restrictions on what you can sell at a Christmas market kind of boggled my mind. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, yeah. <laughs> it went on the news, huh? you can imagine. I think you can Google it. It's, 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 you're not the only one that's saying, you know, what they are doing here. I mean, you know, the thing, are you allowed to sell mangers there, like the Tivity scenes? Mangers? I don't know. And you need to explain that one, that one to me. Sorry, my English. The, the nativity scene is like, you know, with uh, the baby Jesus, Mary, and I Joseph. Know, no, and no. The... They, they were not, but then people complained that because how can you not sell that at the Christmas market? <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> this is, uh, yeah, exactly. That, that's, well, that's exactly. <laughs> You get the if, it's a it's Christmas, if it's a Christmas market, why can't you sell anything that Christmas is actually based on? <laughs> I think you can, you can realize by the discussion that this is all politically driven. That you know, oh, okay. There you go. So, yeah, so there, there we go. go. Exactly. And then you can imagine that you know some people when, you know, it, it's not <laughs> even political. I think it's more, I uh, call it like that, dogmatic driven. And then you say you have to you are to sell this and not this, and you say you know why why are you dictating telling me what I need to sell or what I cannot sell? Then of course, you know most likely a change in the uh, political uh, authorities in the area maybe will come from all the people that want to have a real Christmas market. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. So yeah. listen, we'll, we're going to put you uh, on pause for a second because our our long lost co-founding or co-host here has managed to find his way to the uh to the inn how, how are you doing my intrepid explorer uh, i'm doing pretty well uh t- speaking to you from uh, southern indiana today uh it, out uh, on the exit for sulfur and english or is it english and sulfur uh, i don't remember the exact order but yeah that's where i am at <laughs> where i am Okay, so we've decided that we're going to be sending you a, a calendar, a watch, and an alarm clock for Christmas. Oh, okay. No, <laughs> well, you know, I had, I had, uh, had this all planned, but of course, you know, plans go awry, and uh, uh, so I just wasn't in a position to be able to make it quite to the end on time. But uh, we're, yes. we're also we're also going to send you an application for PETA. You whack all those <laughs> poor little birds. <laughs> yes. By the way, did you eat That's, me yet? Uh, yes, I had the uh, I had the uh, chuckers, and I also uh, ate my prairie chicken. So, <laughs> so do you keep the, uh, the do you keep the feathers and make flies out of them, or something like that? No, I I uh, I've taken tail feathers in the past, but uh, I didn't take any tail feathers this time. Hmm. Just took the meat. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, as, uh, as my friend Jacques said, uh, we, uh, we shot an obscene amount of poultry, uh, between the six of us, we took down 190 birds. Holy Jesus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah that's, that's, that's a good, that's a good haul. Yeah. Uh, how many, a hundred and what? 190. Nine zero. One, nine zero. Yes. Oh my gosh. Did you leave yes. any for next year? Uh, yeah, we left plenty. There are plenty of birds, especially the prairie chickens. Prairie, uh, you know, uh, the guy that we were with said, you know, he's been hunting for 30 years. He's only uh, successfully taken down two prairie chickens. Uh, I tagged mine at distance. And okay, so uh, what's a what's a prairie chicken? I mean, I know what a pheasant is, and that's what you primarily went for, right? Yeah, it's uh pheasant is what we primarily went for, and then they also had chuckers, which are kind of like a smaller pheasant, more like a grouse. A prairie chicken looks like a chicken. It it looks like a chicken. It's kind of like a wild chicken. Uh they are uh colored, both the ma- male and female prairie chickens are colored like 
um, hen pheasants. And they're about the same size as hen pheasants. And so it's easy to mistake. But uh, yeah, you have to have a stamp because it's a it's part of the federal uh, bird program. And so uh, yeah, I had my I had to go buy my stamp because I shot the damn bird. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's that that was the that was the reward for you know shooting this very difficult to shoot bird. Uh, was oh yeah, I had to buy a stamp. For for it and the best uh, part but, was you did it by accident yeah yeah no so, skill involved yeah. i love it uh well no i i it from the my angle and shot i thought it was a uh a, a, you know a, a hen pheasant and so i took down a hen pheasant until the dog brought the br brought the bird back and he went no that's a prairie chicken so <laughs> So Don and I were musing at the beginning here whether or not uh, uh, you or any of your party uh, pulled a Dick Cheney or not. No, no Dick Cheney. We uh, were known as a very safe crew. Uh, also, you know, there's there's members of the crew that are competitive, and so we I kind of let those two competitive guys go be competitive with each other. Uh, in the past, what they've done is to split the competitive guys up and those guys are still competitive. And then, you know, they're shooting a third of the birds. So we put those two always together on the same team. And then the rest of us get to enjoy that a hunt where we don't have to be quick draw McGraw right. uh, because you don't need to be. You don't need to be and you don't need to shoot the bird three times. <laughs> which these guys Man, will do. why would you want to i mean that's just that much more lead you have to pick out of the, the i know the i know wow, it's really know. good it's... unless of course you're so good that it, it, when it falls out of the sky it's already cleaned yeah no <laughs> right. there, there's none of there's none of that going on but uh you know i'm i let the birds get out there a little bit and then i shoot them i'm good at at distance lead shots and that's because I, I do put practice loud golf. I'll go out and shoot trap. And, uh, you know, trap is like golf. You go from station to station and you have different shots that you have to do. It's like playing 18 holes where I go shoot trap. There's 18 stations. And so I call it loud golf. And so I'm, I'm pretty good at leading the birds, but I'm not good at close range. I'm good at, at distance shots. And there's a couple of these guys that, you know, they have three shots in this semi-automatic shotgun. I go out with an old-fashioned over and under brake gun. I have two shots. And so what, what do you shoot? 12 gauge. 12 yeah, 12 gauge. gauge. Yeah, but who makes it? Uh, the gun that I took out this trip is a CZ. So CZ. it's a Turkish, tur Turkish made CZ. The letter C, the letter yeah. Z. And uh, really not very nice over and under. Uh, the, it's called the Drake model. And it's made, it's upland shooting gun. It's it's made for uh, pheasant hunting. Yeah, I and, used to shoot a, a Browning Satori when I was yeah. back in the States. I loved it. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's fun being out there in the middle of Kansas. And I got done with that. And then I had to go make the road trip to Utah and uh, go... Go right, working. because it's on the way. Utah is right on the way from Kansas to uh, Alexander. Right, <laughs> right, right. You know, but no, schedule wise, it, I, this, my schedule got messed up again by some other folks. And it's like, okay, this is when we'll be able to launch this part of the software. Okay, that's fine. I'll be there then. So I got done with hunting and it was like, there was no way I could get home and then fly to Utah in time so it was right. like okay it'll take me two days to drive i'll drive it mm, and i visited on the way out and i visited yeah. on the way back so okay. that's one of so, the things i'm thankful of of is i got to visit a lot of people on this trip at opportune time so you know my friendships and being able to see people i'm very thankful for this year very good
Very good. Because I was just going to ask you, what are you thankful for? And it seems like this is uh, right up your alley. How long were you gone on the road? Uh, uh, this is day 14. Day 14. Now, was the Utah stop, was that work? Because I know you have work up in uh, Utah. Oh, yeah, it was work. It was okay. work. So that means you could write off the whole trip, right? Uh, I'm going to write off. Uh, I, I usually write <laughs> off these trips anyway. Uh, no, because... This is also R&D. One of the things I love about road travel in the U.S. is for my business, it's r and I'm looking at what truck companies do I see out there? What are they, you know, what kind of freight do I see? Do I see a lot of van freight? Do I see a lot of flatbed freight? What am I seeing? Uh, how do the harvests look? Uh, am I seeing a lot of, you know, you know, and I'll talk to people along the way. Because it's getting insight and doing research to understand what's happening with the economy and what's happening, uh, you know, in my realm, which is you know, logistics and transportation. Right. And so, you know, I love to get out here and see what's happening, literally where the river's meeting the road. And so when I travel, I'll talk to drivers. I'll stop at truck stops and talk to drivers. I'll talk to, uh, you know, when I was out there in Kansas hunting, I talked to seven different farmers and these are not small farmers. <laughs> these are guys doing 2,500 acres, 3000 acres. Right. Oh, yeah. uh, you're out there, you're out there in Indiana. Yeah. They got some, <laughs> that's some big stuff out there. Yeah. The, the guys out in Kansas, you know, pretty, pretty uh, interesting what they, you know, what they've gone through this past year with, it's been very dry. Yes. Drought. Uh, and, I don't think that the drought got in the Midwest got a lot of, uh, there wasn't a lot of press about it. There wasn't a lot of information about it, but uh, there in Kansas, there, uh, they were like 14, 15 days below normal on rain. And so when you're walking out in the fields, you can see how the soil's cracked, which is unusual for this time of year. You usually don't see, yeah. big cracks in the soil so they've had a very dry year and uh you know a lot of them kind of grinned at me and said yeah i collected a lot of insurance this year right so so don I, it doesn't sound like uh uh david has tom for an accountant no it doesn't <laughs> no 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 no, no, that's no. In, that's interesting it, did uh any of them bring up any of the uh cost increases that they've been fighting if they've been fighting fertilizer them. every single yeah. one of them every single yep. one of them talked about fertilizer the, uh, which i are... which i think this is an opportune time to actually bring stefan back into the conversation what do you think stefan sure it has been an extremely tough year for many farmers around the world and not just in the u.s in terms yeah. of uh, you know drought and it does decrease the yield it does not be uh, fooling ourselves and then consequence with the war in Ukraine as well that has skyrocketed the price of the crops so in and it depends because yes in some mode it has been challenging in terms of uh, you know getting the crops to grow due to lack of water but the price have sold of course their own price have sold as well because the uh, fertilizer are linked to uh, the price of petrol because it's chemicals and then they have also increased uh, the price of the diesel they put in their, their tractors has also increased, so the cost of running their farm has significantly increased. So, you know, they also it's pretty hard with the uh, prices increase. So it's yeah, it's it has been you know uh, difficult year as usual. It's been for farmer. I never seen a farmer that have an easy year. To be really honest, there's always something either you know drought, uh, water storm, or things like that. So it's not yeah. very, it's not an easy job by far. Yeah. Now, is there anything uh, uh, that the farmers can do, I mean, uh, other than fertilizer, to uh, help their crops in, uh, in when it's a drought? Uh, we do have, I think it's still in research, we do have products that uh, may, it's sort of, a, you know, Frankenstein stuff, but I will describe to you what it does in, in, in bigger picture then, of course, is, you know somewhere in research well, i don't want you to divulge but... anything that's not in no, no. the open so no, but, no, no, but what, what i mean is you have a product you, you i will describe it that way let's say that you want to go on holiday for three weeks 
and you have a bunch of plants in your apartment or house that you know you need to water but of course you say okay i don't have a friendly neighbor because whatever reason that cannot water the plants for me so you spray those plants with that magical uh, formula and all of a sudden they will be as healthy as when you left them with no water so now you translate that to a cropper right right interesting interesting stuff yeah that, um that, that will that will that may happen but you know it's, it's not uh, you know you cannot just do that overnight of course, right even eggs take two minutes so, <laughs> so. right so <laughs> so david um you you said something about the soil being cracked i mean i'm i'm thinking about like uh you see it after the desert after there's been a flood and then the desert dries up and the uh and the uh, the soil sort of like uh, curls and 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 has fissures. Is that what you're describing? Yeah, it literally shrinks. Is yeah. is what happens, and it shrinks and it, and it creates these fissures. And you'll always see some surface cracking. You know, it gets really muddy, and you know, a mud puddle dries up, and that those top layers crack and curl but it doesn't, the fissures don't go very deep in that right. mud puddle. But, right. you know, I'm walking fields that were planted with Milo or planted with um, uh, hay. And I'm looking down and I'm seeing cracks going into the soil that are maybe four or five inches deep. And so the soil, the, these top layers, of the soil given up so much moisture that they had shrunken and cracked and, and opened up. So uh, the, the family that, that, that farms the land where we were doing the hunting, uh, their uh, Milo crop was pretty, you know, was, was worthless as far as a crop was concerned. Um, but their hay was fine. And a big chunk of what they do is cattle. And so uh, they do a lot of a lot of cattle. They do a, a grow feed for the cattle. That's what the mm -hmm. Milo is for. Um, but you know, f farmers there in Central Kansas they they have multiple businesses, and so every single one of the uh, adults in that family there's there's two generations. They're all school teachers, and so they teach school. Uh, right. So they have that steady income, and then they do this um, what's contr called controlled shooting. Uh, so they uh, they have a, a part of their family that grows the the birds, grows the uh, pheasant, and then they release the pheasant, and then have people come out who pay to go hunt the property. Ah, so, so now it's now it's all coming clear. Okay, so these are um, this is inventory control. They grow quote unquote grow pheasant and then release it and then um, uh, allow people to hunt on their property for a fee to get the pheasant. Is that what correct. I'm hearing? Correct. Okay. Correct. All right, and you're able to to hunt their property at t periods that are outside normal season. So pheasant, actual pheasant season in Kansas didn't start until this past, just this past weekend, yesterday or the, yeah. this past Saturday. And we were hunting a week before season started. And I know that we got some wild pheasant, but we got mostly, you know, uh, grown okay. pheasant. That makes that makes more sense because I was thinking, Jesus, if you guys got 190, and I'm thinking, you know, how many of these birds can there be? But now, now it's making more sense. You know, when I was in South Africa. You know, um, one of my uh, friends had uh, another friend that owned a game farm. Okay, I mean, it's a big open expanse of of property. You know, that's fenced. But it's, you know, it's a, I don't even know how many heck acres it is, but it's a gigantic place. And you're able to go out there and hunt, but uh, there's a price uh, associated with every animal that you get. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a springbok is pretty cheap because there are a lot of them. Reeboks are more expensive. Kudu are even more expensive. And then you get into the lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. Uh, and those things could be incredibly expensive. But what they're doing is they're, um, they're managing their inventory. So, yep. you know, people are worried about, you know, animals being hunted to extinction. 
on these game farms, you have to understand that they don't want their animals to become extinct because, you know, you're actually paying, you know, you might pay $50,000 to, to get a lion. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that goes to um, growing other lions, you know what I mean? For the future. So, uh, you know, these animals are much better uh, managed uh, for posterity on the game farms than they are uh, uh, otherwise. But we went and visited. We went and visited where the birds, where they, where the birds get grown by the cousins, right. and uh, these pens. These are are pen raised birds, so they're free flight birds. Right. They're not. They're not in small cages or anything else. These are ginormous right. pens, and so to give you a sense, they have six of these pens that are um, about seventy five yards wide and one hundred and fifty yards long. And, and how and how high 35 40 feet high yeah and so you know pheasant don't fly real super high they shoot right. up about 15 20 feet and then they fly and glide for about a quarter mile right and so but we went walked into these pens there's ten thousand birds in these pens and this 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 raising operation doesn't just feed the the seafers they feed many other controlled shooting uh, operations there in central Kansas. It is it is a multi million dollar business, right? And probably, but it's it's brings, designed to be sustainable though. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, it is. And so they grow Milo to feed the birds. That's one of the things that they do. They grow the feed for the birds. Uh, they. You know, they don't buy birds. Uh, right. the, a lot of the birds are, you know, there's eggs. And so they go out and collect the eggs every day in the, in the pens and they incubate right. the birds. It is very, you know, very sustained operation. And, you know, considering that, all right, it cost me $800 to, you know, for the hunt itself. And, and that included the lodging. So, okay. the, you know. And you're there not, for a week, right? No, I was there for two days. It was two oh, days two of days. hunting, okay. two days of hunting. And in two days of hunting, I walked away with 30 pounds, 35 pounds of poultry. It's and good times that you didn't shoot anybody. And good times. And nobody got shot. Yeah. Right. Now, <laughs> so I would assume raised... that Alec, Bald Alec Baldwin wasn't in your party, right? <laughs> no, he wasn't there either. Okay. Now he's. Now so they he's raised all these. Day. He's blaming everybody. Anyway. So they raise all these birds so you just so you can go out and whack them. That's right. First four. That's right. <laughs> of course. And and for and for eating. And for eating. So and, yeah. and for eating. Now now, Stefan, you being you know, European, I, I would assume that you know not too many people actually go out hunting here, it appears. Um, so you probably have not had the opportunity, but you said you had some some relatives in the States. Are they rootin' tootin' kind of folks, or are they city folks? I, I think they are city folks, from what I understood. <laughs> I haven't seen them for a while because, you know, travel, traveling across was not easy, but they are city folks. I'm confirming this one. So, yes, I don't think they are in thing. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we have a speed round here and, uh, and wrap it up, all right? So, uh, Don, we're going to start with you as far as uh, what are you thankful, most thankful for period this year personal uh and you know like that happened to you and then if you want to give kudos to anybody like your wife you can do that too but what's the one thing that you're <laughs> what's the one thing that you're thankful for for yourself well right now like i say it's just you know we've been busy and i'm you know thankful for that we've had a couple of down years and it you know took its toll on us and you know now things are coming back around and i'm thankful we've had a real good uh had a real good year you know we've picked up some more customers and stuff so we were doing pretty good so, you know the beer brewing has been going real well we made some modifications to some of the stuff that we've done you know uh made some adjustments to water chemistry and a little bit to the processes and stuff so we you know coming along pretty good there so everything looks good as far as i'm goes and i got to give kudos to the wife once again because like i say she you know she takes care of me and keeps me grounded a bit you know as much as she can yeah. <laughs> right excellent how about uh, you david what are you most thankful for well you know 
it's it's been a fantastic year business wise, and you know I'm thankful for that. But I'm also thankful. You know, my family's had very good health. You know, my daughters are doing well in school, and and they're happy. I, uh, you know, even after all the the craziness with COVID and all that, they, you know, are uh, are regaining that their their. Uh, uh, their their footing very well, and then um, you know the the ability to play play with the robotics team and work with the robotics team because it's just so much fun to do that, and I'm really looking forward to uh, this next season because um, it's this will be the eighth year that I will have been doing this now, and uh, uh, the it will be the fourth year doing it without a kid, you know, my own kid involved in the program. And uh, it's still just so much freaking fun to be able to, you know, work with the kids and, you know, get my hands on the robot. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Stefan, how about you? I am very grateful that we have sort of a normal back, a normal life. It's looked like COVID has been, you know, the big wave of COVID are sort of finished for this year. Hopefully, <laughs> my son just came yeah. back a bit coughing and saying that this pasta had no taste this lunchtime, but you know, it may come back with a vengeance, but hopefully not. So I will be very thankful for that because it's uh, much easier to do business and things like that when you can speak to people face to face and uh, interact with people face to face at one point. Uh, so very grateful to have human connection again. I will put it yeah. that way. And uh, that's linked to health for that. Otherwise, business has been good and grateful to all the people that have helped me with my business or, you know, daily work. I would call it like that if it's not really a business, if you see what I mean. Right. right. <laughs> your colleagues and your my colleagues, ears, but, you yeah. know, more than colleagues, because there is also external people helping. You, so, yeah, yeah, good, good. Well, for me, you know, it's, uh, I'm thankful that I've had a great year um, business wise and uh and also very thankful for the opportunity to actually get out in the field. You know, for uh, before this year, um, you know, I, I did a lot of field work, but a lot of other people did, you know. And this year, I, I was turning the wrench, and it felt really good to be able to go out there and still know I could turn a wrench, you know, and, and you know, roll up my sleeves and get hunker down and get dirty. And, um, and so, yeah, I'm really... Really happy that I was able to demonstrate that I still got it. Um, uh, and of course, it's always you know, so much, it's always so much fun to be in the Gemba, isn't it? It really is. I mean, you know, <laughs> and I don't want to say that I was completely removed from it, you know, in years prior, but you know, you own a business and, and you know, especially when you have a bunch of employees and contractors and, and experts, you know, you sort of like uh, bubble to the top and you don't necessarily have the opportunity to really get down to where the nuts and bolts get turned and the, the TIG welders are, are turned on and, and et cetera. Um, so it really felt good to, to just go out and just, you know, be able to roll up my sleeves and show the old man still got it. You know what I mean? These young whippersnappers, you know, <laughs> <laughs> they still don't have anything on me, I guess. Uh, so that was, that was good. Um, and, you know, it's really, it's always great to, to see that my book uh, gets uh, wider and wider uh, well-known. Um, you know, I, I got a, a message and a connection request on LinkedIn uh, um, uh, just recently from a person that uh, we did a leadership development at Lockheed Martin six years ago. And, you know, how, uh, and he's just now getting connected with me because he's changing jobs and he's read my bu- a book back to back and like, he was just fawning over it and, 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 you know, sharing how, uh, how exquisite it was. So, you know, it's good to hear that, um, you know, these things have a, a long tail, as you know, so, and, you know, the two boys, my two boys are gainfully employed, everybody's healthy. So, you know what, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just ride this way for a while and thankful to do that. Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah at least business has been good for everybody this year. Yeah, I'm really glad to good. hear that. So, <clears throat> so well, uh, I guess uh, we've uh, reached another end of our our session there, Don and uh, David. And you know, unfortunately, David, you're the call in this time, so I'm going to have to defer to uh, my 
co-host here for the uh yeah well for the don't conclusion. drive like either of my brothers come yeah, on and don't, and Just don't, don't, don't drive like either of my brothers yeah and don't <laughs> drive like my brother and don't drive like my brother and just make sure that you bring your phone along with you next time. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's got it. Yeah. <laughs> I, All right, everybody. That's what I'm on. Okay. We'll, Take care. We'll see guys. you later. Have a great night. Cheers. Happy. All right. Have a good day. Bye. been listening to another episode of the outliers in with your hosts joseph paris and david schneider this program is produced by the operational excellence society and sponsored by zonatech consulting group international